Welcome to chapter 11, part 2, proteins. Here we shall discuss the properties of membrane proteins. As this slide notes, membrane proteins are designed to allow certain molecules, which cannot make it through the membrane, to pass in and out of cells. So proteins can be viewed as special doorways, which can be opened and closed based on circumstances to allow the passage of certain molecules in and out of cells. Uh, fact two here states that proteins are 50% by mass. We discussed this earlier. The percentage may be different in different cell types. However, even though the proteins are equal in mass, they are not equal in number. Because the lipid molecules are much smaller, there's always more per unit area. So the ratio in animal cells is 50 to 1. Regardless, proteins have many functions, and those functions you have to learn. Where do we start? Well, the good news is that proteins can be classified into four types. Transporter proteins, they do exactly what the word says. They move material in and out of the cell. In order to move material in and out of the cell, the protein has to be in a configuration that is considered open. The second class of proteins are anchor proteins. What they do is anchor other molecules to particular locations, either within the membrane or between one cell and another cell, keeping the two cells stuck together. The third class of proteins are called receptor proteins. They convey information about the outside world to the inside of the cell by binding to ligands. In this particular case, the ligand is in red. Once the ligand binds to the protein, it causes a conformational change on the inside that is then detected by other molecules, which then become activated. And finally, the fourth class of protein embedded in the membrane are enzymes. These enzymes can also be turned on and off, and when these enzymes are on, they convert products. The shape of proteins is also very important. In some cases, the proteins pass through the membrane from the cytoplasmic side through to the extracellular side, as in the case of these three. These class of proteins are known as transmembrane proteins. An alternative class of protein embedded in the membrane are membrane associated. They are present in one leaflet or the other and are difficult to remove, but they perform their function at that location. A third class of linked protein, these are covalently linked to lipid molecules in the membrane, but the protein itself is present outside the leaflet. And the fourth class of proteins are peripheral membrane proteins in that they are associated through non-covalent means with other proteins or other molecules which are part of the membrane. So these two green proteins here on the outside of the cell and here on the inside of the cell are called peripheral membrane proteins. One very important concept that you have been made aware of is that the interior of a lipid membrane is very resistant to any kind of charge. Unfortunately, the backbone of a polypeptide, a protein, consists of repeating amino acids, which have slight positive and slight negative charges as indicated here. So the nitrogen atom has a slight negative charge and the hydrogen atom opposite it has a slightly positive charge. The adjacent carbon has a slight positive charge and the oxygen to which it's attached is slightly negative. And this, this pattern repeats throughout the polypeptide along each amino acid. This type of charge distribution would not be tolerated amongst the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tails of the phospholipids. So nature has come up with a number of different solutions. One fantastic solution is to only have amino acids with side groups that are hydrophobic facing towards the tails of the phospholipids. In this case, the light green molecules are the side groups of the amino acids and the dark green ribbon represents the amino acid backbone. In this configuration, the protein is able to exist thermodynamically quite stably within 
the phospholipid bilayer without interfering too much with the entropy of the system. So this solution is to embed deep inside the molecule the hydrophilic parts and have the hydrophobic parts on the outer perimeter facing the hydrophobic environment. In some circumstances, a wider channel is necessary to allow passage of material across the membrane. In this particular example, we have a very large protein which makes these cylindrical turns while it passes from one side of the membrane to the other, and then it repeats this four more times to form this five-cylinder structure where the center is hydrophobic and the green areas on the periphery are hydrophilic and they can then exist embedded in the lipid bilayer. In other circumstances, nature needs even larger structures to pass material across the membrane. One solution is to have beta barrels form these very large pores. Here we have a very large sheet of protein which is wrapped around into a three-dimensional shape with the side groups of the amino acids which are hydrophobic facing the hydrophobic components of the lipid membrane. A great example of this are the aquaporins which allow large amounts of water to pass through bacterial cells when these pores are open. Yet another fantastic example of how proteins have become highly modified is this bacteria rhodopsin. Here we can see a retinal molecule in purple which is really vitamin A embedded within this protein in green which spans the membrane of a bacterial cell. When light energy is trapped by the retinal molecule, the retinal molecule changes shape. That causes the protein in which it sits to change shape also. And the effect is that protons are pumped from the interior of the bacterial cell into the extracellular space. This causes the inside of the bacteria to have a very low concentration of protons and the outside to have a very high concentration of protons. And this energy difference can then be made useful by the bacteria at a later stage to perform some kind of work. As we have mentioned multiple times before, the lipid bilayer is quite flimsy in the sense that it doesn't have much internal strength. Proteins can be deposited on either side of the membrane to enhance its stability and strength. And one great example is with red blood cells, where their shape is maintained quite easily by proteins which are deposited on the inside of the plasma membrane, giving them structural stability. Here we see the internal surface of the plasma membrane of red blood cells. And these transmembrane proteins in green are anchored to each other by a vast network of cables made of further proteins that anchor one region to another, giving red blood cells great stability, especially when their role is to travel at a high speed through blood vessels. The outer surface of most cells, depending on the degree of the sugars, these layers have multiple functions, mainly in protecting the cell from the environment, or as in the immune system, providing self-recognition properties. This figure here shows a great example. The outer surface contains the sugar molarities, and there are no such sugar molecules on the inside. One of the most challenging slides in this section is uh, this one here. White blood cells traveling fast in blood vessels are brought to a standstill so that they can leave the vessel and enter the tissue at the site of an infection. The infection itself causes the release of chemicals which then travel and affect cells lining the blood vessel. Those cells will then start expressing quite quickly on their surface additional proteins that were not there prior to the infection. The surface of white blood cells always has these particular molecules which bind to the surface proteins. This process is similar to Velcro in that these proteins and these carbohydrates will adhere to each other in a fashion that slows down the white blood cell, causing it to roll and then come to a standstill. Once the blood cell has reached a standstill, it then changes its properties 
and melts its way through the lining of the blood vessel to enter the site of infection. This only happens if these cells have been asked to form these lectin molecules on the surface. There's a nice video on the internet that explains this. This slide represents a historical experiment where scientists were able to prove that the proteins embedded in the membrane are not affixed to a particular location, i.e. they are free to move in any direction they wish. So basically what the scientists did was they labeled mouse cell proteins with a fluorescent dye on the outside and they did the same thing with humans but using a different color. Using various techniques they fused the cells together to generate this hybrid cell and they watched to see what happened over time. As indicated here within about 40 minutes the proteins from the mouse half and the human half were intermingled proving that proteins are motile. Today we now know that in certain circumstances cells have evolved to contain proteins in particular locations. So looking at panel A, you can see that the green proteins in this membrane are held in a cluster by molecules attached to the inside, which prevent those proteins from migrating away from this area. This will be an example, for instance, as a lipid raft. Here in panel B, we have the same situation, but in this case, the anchoring molecule is on the outside, which adheres to the proteins and also prevents them from migrating. Down here in panel C, we have a situation of where cells are adhering to each other, and they do so in most cases by making protein to protein contact. So a great example here would be skin cells, where one cell is attached to the neighboring cell these type of cell, cell junctions would be then classified as desmosomes, which we encountered earlier in another chapter. Finally, in panel D, we have specialized proteins in different regions of the membrane. So the top of the cell contains the green proteins, whereas the bottom of the cell only contains the blue proteins. And you can see these black bars, they are indicating an area that prevents the proteins from one half of the cell from passing through to the other half. Have one side facing the contents of your digestive tract up here, and the other side is facing the blood supply, which would be down here. In this case, the green proteins would be picking up from the outside materials like glucose and passing them through to the inside of the cytoplasm. Red proteins would do the opposite. They would be tasked with picking up material from the cytoplasm and passing it through to the extracellular fluid on this side. Nature keeps the different proteins which have opposite functions from intermixing by having these very important tight junctions that bound each cell together. Not so obvious on the previous slide but made obvious on this slide is that there are two pathways by which fluids or other material may pass from one side of a tissue layer to the other. In this case, the first pathway is known as transcellular. It entails the molecule first passing through the upper plasma membrane, then traveling through the cytoplasm, and then leaving the cell through the lower plasma membrane into the extracellular fluid down here. An alternative pathway is known as paracellular. In this case, molecules travel from one side to the other without passing through any plasma membrane. They simply sneak between two cell membranes passing from one side to the other. In many cases, nature wishes to prevent this, such as your bladder, where you do not want urine, which is stored in the bladder, passing back into your bodily tissues and your blood supply. So tight junctions are utilized to bring the plasma membranes of neighboring cells extremely close together and using suitable proteins uh, sealing this gap. This table lists the different types of protein functional classes, transporters, ion channels, anchoring proteins, receptors and enzymes, and gives examples of each type. That concludes this video lecture 